Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Abraham Tesser. He is Distinguished Research Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Georgia, U.S. His research has made significant contributions to several areas in the field of social psychology. He created the self-evaluation maintenance model, a theory in social psychology that focuses on the motives for self-enhancement. So, Dr. Tesser, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to have you on. The pleasure is mine. Thank you, Ricardo. Okay, great. So, uh, I mean, we're going to focus our entire conversation on the self-evaluation maintenance model. So, I guess that my first question would be exactly what it is about, if you could give us maybe uh, a summary of what it is, please. Well, it is a social psychological model. Uh, psychologists, of course, sort of focus on the individual, but social psychologists, you, you want to see the individual in a social context. And the self-evaluation model uh, tries to make sense of uh, how the performance of other individuals affect our own well-being, our own sense of self, our own self-evaluation. And uh, after thinking about it and observing lots of behavior, uh, it seemed to me that when we uh, witness the performance of another person and that performance is outstanding or very good, we tend to have sometimes diametrically opposed reactions to it. On the one hand, well, when you see a great performance, you can enjoy it. You know, you applaud, it's wonderful. But what if you connect it to that individual? Yeah. What happens then? It's not just the performance, you're also connected in some way. So if it's, if it's somebody you, you, you have a relationship with, a, a, a friendship, a, a relative, uh, uh, somebody you went to school with when you were you know, in, in the third grade, if you have that, and they do great, you just sit there and you glow. You become alive. You feel terrific. Why? Hey, that's my friend over there. That's my that's my cousin. This wonderful event I am connected to, and it's almost as if we draw, as if we were somehow responsible for that performance. That all of this, all of these good things are happening to us. Why? It's because we have some kind of psychological connection to that person. And uh, uh, Bob Cialdini did a beautiful job in naming this phenomenon. He called it berging or basking in reflected glory. Um, but there has to be two things have to happen for this. One is the performance has to be good. You know, you, if your cousin goes up there and you, there's nothing to brag about. There's no uh, so the performance has to be good. And the second is there has to be some kind of connection between you and that other person. And, you know, some connections are obvious and uh, some are very subtle. I mean, even coming from the same hometown makes a difference. Uh, I actually heard one person bragging about standing at a urinal next to a very famous person. So the connections can be very far flung. So one reaction to somebody's good performance is, joy, happiness, basking, reflected glory, we feel good, and it's almost as if their performance rubs off on us. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, sometimes we see somebody do a great performance and we feel awful. Why? Because they're doing better than us. So we somehow compare ourselves to this other person, and since this performance is outstanding, we suffer by comparison. Now, it turns out that we can enjoy, you know, we, you know, if you want to be a great tennis player, you can go to a match and enjoy a great tennis player. But if it's your cousin that's doing it, somehow the, the tendency to compare yourself to that person becomes uh, greater. So you don't, you, you're not, 
likely to compare yourself to somebody you have no connection with, but as the connections get closer and closer, as you're drawn into more of a psychological relationship to this person, the tendency to compare goes up and your, your feelings about this great performance are somehow more threatening, uh, they're more negative in terms of affective tone, um, and so you have two sides of a coin. This great performance of the other person can make you feel good or it can be threatening. And these two processes I call a reflection process on the one hand or a comparison process on the other hand. And they notice notice here, these are the same things, but they're generating opposite reactions. So the question then becomes, well, when will you get one thing? When will you get the other thing? You with me? Mm -hmm. So uh, here comes the third parameter of the model. Okay. The third parameter is a parameter that says when one is going to be important and when the other process is going to be important. And that parameter I call relevance, but we all know as kind of a self-identity. There's a world out there full of possibilities for performance, potential for performance. There's the world of art, there's the world of science, there's the world of music, there's the world of literature. All of these things, law, medicine, we can be good at any one of these things, but we, we're not. We, we stake our identities on only a small portion of these things. Yeah. And when this performance turns out to be related or directly on top of what's important to us, we are likely to compare ourselves and be threatened by comparison. On the other hand, if I want to be a great lawyer and you just did something wonderful in medicine, I can bask in your reflected glory. So that, that in essence, is the underlying um, sort of dynamics of the model. But so far, it's a model about squishy things, you know, sort of feeling something you can't touch, something you can't feel, yep. all. What I want to do as a scientist is predict something that's observable. Mm -hmm. And since we know how this works as a system, we can make some predictions about each of the components. Mm -hmm. That is, we can make some predictions about when you want to draw yourself more closely into a relationship or pull back from a relationship. We can make predictions about closeness. Or we can make predictions about when you'll uh, denigrate somebody's performance, when you'll uh, sort of exaggerate the goodness of their performance, or when you'll uh, put out some more yourself. So we can make some predictions about relative performance and measure that. And finally, we can look at the way that people think about themselves, because there is a certain amount of plasticity in uh, what we define ourselves out and what's important to us. And if the model unfolds the way we think it unfolds, and if people want to feel good about themselves, we can see their self-definition changing or becoming more ossified and so on. So, in essence, the model is about how uh, other people's performance affects our own sort of, uh, theoretically, our own sort of feelings about self and how they play themselves out in uh, these three variables, closeness, performance, and relevance. Mm -hmm. Very well. Okay, so before we get into other details, let me ask you this. Do we know where exactly during development a child acquires the necessary psychological tools for it to be able to self-evaluate and to compare itself with other people, other children, for example. Do we know that? I, I personally don't know that, but I suspect it comes very early. We, we even see signs of it in, in uh, non-human animals. Uh, when conspecifics are getting, if you have dogs, for example, if you give something to one dog, you know. So kids know very early uh, 
where their place is in the family, whether they're the one who's the athlete or not the athlete. Uh, and in fact, we have some uh, uh, developmental, well, uh, uh, adolescent data that by the time adolescence comes around, these processes are very much in place. But my guess is it happens much earlier. Uh, it's, it's unclear whether this is a hardwired kind of phenomenon. Uh, I, my own feeling is there are certainly some components of it that we're sort of born with. And as we understand the world around us, they unfold. Uh, but also being in a family, being in any group, um, is an antecedent to these kinds of things because we specialize in groups. We all have our place, you know, there are status and roles and so on. So I, I suspect it happens very early, you can't know. Mm -hmm. But probably not since birth, because it probably is no. the case that children will have to develop certain psychological tools to be able to think that way, right? Yes. Now, but I would argue that a lot of this that I'm describing to you sounds um, like deeply uh, involved thought and cognitive, uh, you know, conscious processing. Okay. But almost all of this, I would think, goes on at a very uh, a non a non conscious level. People are unaware that they're sort of engaging in these in these things. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be conscious nor something verbal, right? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. In fact, uh, we've observed people uh, in which you can see these dynamics playing themselves out in a laboratory. Um, and if you interview them afterwards, they have no idea that they've done it. Uh, we, we've uh, we've taken uh, measures of facial expressions as they change, and they change very quickly and very briefly. Uh, and you can see, you know, the affective parts of what I'm talking about here reflected on their face. You know, they hear that their friend uh, just outperformed them on something that was important to them, yeah. and their face changes. Uh, and you talk to them afterwards, and they say, no. I was delighted. My friend did well. Everything is terrific. Mm -hmm. So, and that's another issue because sometimes people uh, contradict themselves. I, I mean, perhaps contradiction is not the correct word because people don't even have a conscious access to the own uh, to their own motivations, right? Yes, absolutely right. I don't think they're dissembling. For example, uh, we do studies in which. We ask them to make ratings of the other person that we're keeping track of, or we give them an opportunity. For example, in one of the earliest studies we've done, we've given them the opportunity to give people uh, who are doing a task, make it difficult for them by giving them hard, hard information versus, you know, easy. And then you interview them afterwards. And you, I mean, they behave according to the model, but they, don't, and they know that we're watching them. It's not like, you know, it's not like they can't be caught. And they don't want to be caught. They honestly think, oh, no, I was always kind to my friend. I always, you know, uh, but that's not the way it is. And I don't think they're, they're lying. Um, if you think about the social desirability and the way we think about things, that you know, if you're connected to somebody and then you're in a relationship, you should always be kind to them, kind to that the people you don't know, all of that. We, it's all, yeah, it's all in here. But when we don't do that, you know, we're violating our own sort of sense of what we think should we should be doing. And uh, it, perhaps, you know, it, 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 if you were a psychoanalyst, you would say it was repressed or something like that. I don't, I don't think it it comes to conscious awareness, often. Now, sometimes we are aware of it, but frequently we're not. And we certainly don't go through the machinations that I've just been going through with you consciously. Right. 
so, I mean, when people go through their self-evaluation process, let's say, uh, you said at a certain point there that uh, there are different social niches that they can fill. For example, they might be interested in having a certain occupation, a certain profession, and so they compare themselves with people from that specific niche. But right. aren't, aren't there probably also uh, more general aspects of social life or social position, social standing that people pay attention to while doing that? Like, for example, in general, being high or low status, being more or less popular, being successful with uh, acquiring friends and intimate relationships and things like that. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and uh, there are two prompts to the uh, response I would make to you. Mm -hmm. One is, what I'm describing is, a, is a, a circumcised set of behaviors. And it does not, to any extent, say that all this other stuff is not going on. That is, mm -hmm. you know, learning theory really works. If you reward it and you punish, that really works. Uh, you, we want to be popular, and a way to do that is to be similar, it's, it's to be uh, ingratiating, all of that stuff works. But there is a circumscribed set of social behaviors um, that behave like a system, and this system seems to be part of this whole thing of the self wants to be evaluated positively. And you know, I'm retired from psychology for a long time, but my guess is that it's it's such um, it's such a, 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 a primary kind of phenomenon that people want to feel good about themselves, want to be popular, want to be part of a group, all of that um, that that maintains its role as a you know a, a, a focus of study uh, within social psychology. And this is one set of variables that feed into that. And when I say feed into that, I actually, you know, in some later work, I, I, I was interested in sort of generalizing self-processes, uh, mechanisms across a, a variety. And from my point of view, it turns out that the mechanisms associated with the SEM model, with cognitive dissonance, with uh, value expression, all those mechanisms, mechanisms are sort of um, similar and feed into one another. In other words, all of these things are going on and uh, uh, they interact in a way that we're only beginning to understand. So the short answer, I'll give you a short answer. You're right, all of those other things are going on. <laughs> Okay, uh, so, uh, I mean, we are using the word self, but I guess that the concept of the self is a very tricky and complicated one in psychology, right? Uh, what would you give us as a definition of the self here? Well, I think it's a, a bundle of, uh, of uh, attributes that we connect to our physical being. Uh, it would include notions of what we look like, notions of what we can do, and notions of what we like and dislike. So uh, all of those go into what we think of as the self. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, in terms of the self-evaluation maintenance model, um, we've already talked a little bit about the several different uh, situations and people with whom we might compare our, ourselves. But, I mean, are there specific kinds of people uh, with whom we do that more frequently? Like, for example, friends, family members, people that are part of our community? Yes. Uh, well, I use the word closeness. And your examples map beautifully onto the idea of closeness. Friends, family members, um, but it goes much beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Fritz Heider talked about something he called unit relatedness, unit relations. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, are you familiar with that? Uh, no. Could you explain it? Yeah. It just means that somehow there is a psychological connection between two persons. And that psychological connection can be the obvious uh, kinds of things that we generally speak about when we talk about closeness, family, um, friendships, but they could be other things also. Um, if you're particularly tall and another tall person comes in the room, immediately there's a connection between you and, and that person. If you're from New York City, where there are, you know, 8 million people, being from New York City doesn't connect you. But if you're in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and you're both from New York City, that's a connection. Yeah. Almost anything that's like, you know, you, uh, the room is full of men, and you're, you're a woman, and another woman comes in. That's a connection. It's a kind of a gestalt idea that when you see things that maybe uh, separate them from, you know, the ground, they're connected. So psychological connection can be, is very, very broad. Uh, it's not very well defined, obviously, from what I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. um, but all of those things, I believe, go into whether or not you're likely to compare yourself to that person. Well, yeah, if you're one woman and the other woman comes in, and uh, that woman does something distinctive, hey, the women have won, you know? Or um, if they do something distinctive in your area, how come you weren't the person to do it? So anything that connects you, uh, puts you together with that person in a psychological way, increases closeness, increases the tendency to bask in their good behavior, to support their good behavior, increases the tendency to be threatened when they they outdo you. Mm -hmm. So in a certain way, it also depends a little bit on the context that we're talking about, because, for example, I would imagine that the same person in two different contexts, maybe one of them, because I'm interested in the same things that uh, she is, she, uh, I compare myself with her, but in another yeah. context where she is basically relevant for me, then I don't do that. Uh, exactly right. The example I gave you about the New Yorker in New York versus the New Yorker in, in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's contextual. Um, and it, it, it's hard to know whatever it is, but if there's something distinctive about you and you share it with somebody else in a context, boom. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about things like friendships or relationships between people that are very close, like family, for example, uh, what are the kinds of things that we expect to get from those relationships and that perhaps are relevant for our self-evaluation? Well, uh, there are lots of things and I come back to uh, something I said a moment ago. The fact that I have, you know, I, I, I did some work on the self-evaluation maintenance model is a cir it's circumscribed. What we, what we hope to get from relationship is much broader than you know, nurturing, uh, companionship, uh, uh, intimacy, uh, support, all of those things we tend to get. But the fact that we're in a relationship makes the possibilities for taking joy in another person's um, um, accomplishments or being threatened by that person's accomplishments multiply. And again, it's, it's both sides of that coin. It is people to whom we are connected that are most consequential in, in these kinds of processes. Mm -hmm. uh, also, because there are probably instances where if we are friends with a particular person, 
we would prefer that that person doesn't compete with us at least uh, in certain contexts and uh, at certain levels, right? Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. In fact, uh, you know, we talked about uh, relevance being a, a, a parameter of the model, an important part of the model. And I think within families, within friendships, uh, within those kinds of uh, intimate relationships, uh, we negotiate those things. When I first began this research on self-esteem maintenance, um, I ran into a, a, a somebody who was a student with me in, in graduate school, and she married a third student. All, you know, we were all in the social psychology program, we're all doing the same thing. And, uh, I started to describe the model to her, and she says to me, she starts smiling, and I say, what are you smiling about? She says, my husband and I are not in the same field anymore. That is, they had renegotiated what it meant to be a social psychologist. I'm this kind of a social psychologist, and you're this kind of a social psychologist. So we... You know, and if you see that uh, uh, within academic couples, some becomes the uh, data analyst and the other one is the writer. Or, you know, they, they split it up and they manage to find a way. Cooks, I'm the baker. She is the, uh, uh, um, you know, she, she makes the pasta. What could I tell you? <laughs> Yes, I, I don't know if this is a good example or not, but since you were referring to social psychologists, I guess that sometimes with intellectual people, it is very easy in romantic relationships, for example, for people to get frustrated if the other person starts showing signs that she is much more knowledgeable of a particular subject that is of interest or something like that, because then little by little, it sort of gets into a situation where people are competing with one another because the other person thinks, oh, you, uh, you shouldn't be more intelligent than I am or something like that. Yes, you, you raised that early, you raised an issue like that earlier when you said, oh, there's these general things, you know, and intelligence is one of them. And of course, almost anything you do feeds into that. So, you know, if you define yourself that broadly, you're screwed. I mean, somehow there's always going to be somebody. <laughs> but uh, I do think that the, uh, people, uh, and, you know, I worked with a, a, a wonderful uh, gentleman by the name of Steve Beach, who is a, a clinical psychologist, and he's interested in, uh, or when we were working together, he was interested in marriage. And uh, we extended the, we tried to extend the model to uh, committed romantic relationships. And it turns out um, that that does make a difference. I'm not sure if it makes a difference more generally, but at least in that context, committed relationships get people change their behavior in, 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 a, in a subtle way. And let me uh, see if I can uh, elaborate on that for just a minute, Ricardo. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, the model, when, you know, when I first started thinking about the model and how it worked and all of that, I was sort of surprised by it. And the very first experiment I ran, I couldn't believe that it worked. I just couldn't believe that it actually worked. And this is the, the first experiment was, you know, you're, you're, you're really holding your friend back more than a stranger in certain contexts. I, I, that's not, I looked at the data over and over again, I couldn't believe it. But you know, that's, that's, that's what people did. So I thought, well, this is a surprising thing. Sometimes you hurt your friend more than, you know, a stranger. That's a surprising thing. But it turns out that people in committed relationships understand the rules. I don't know that they can articulate it, but they understand the rules of the model very well. And what do I mean by that? If we set up circumstances in which we control what's relevant to the self, and what's relevant to the partner, uh, within a committed relationship, we find something very interesting. We find that people 
take into account these uh, self-evaluation maintenance uh, concerns of their partner. So if I know, if you and I are in a relationship and I know that you really feel good about uh, doing podcasts and, and things like that, uh, A, I will, uh, I will feel good when you're successful at it. I will try to avoid it in my own self-definition and I will support you in that. So, uh, it's, it's as, now, the, so it's, it's as if each partner, I don't think it's conscious, but I, it's as if each partner collaborates in maintaining one another's self-esteem to the extent they can. Now, sometimes it turns, so this means negotiating, you know, what's relevant to each of the partners, you know, because if you both want to be podcasters and, you know, you're, you're getting the people to sign up with you and people to listen to what you're doing, there's not much I can do about it for myself, you know. You, uh, but uh, within committed relationships, people sort of negotiate those uh, self areas. I think where they, you know, where they, where there is overlap, they sort of make distinctions about it, and they act in such a way as to support the other. So, if we're in a committed relationship and you get, uh, uh, and it's something is good for you, I feel good about it. Uh, if something is good for me, I feel good about it. But I get an extra burst of knowing that things are going well for you with respect to these kinds of dynamics. And the effect is additive. It's not interactive. It's it's not that the self-esteem evaluation model works less well or uh, one way or the other. It's simply additive. I pay attention to what's good for you. Uh, uh, I, I don't want you to uh, falter on what's important to you. I want to take joy in what you do well, and you want to take joy in what I do well, and you don't want to threaten me on things where, where, that's, uh, where that's likely. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a romantic relationship. It, it, you, you can uh, uh, compete, and it's hard on a relationship. And... Um, I mean, we all know people like that. We've, we've seen it. We've seen relationships break up. So it happens. But on the average, especially in better relationships, we're, we're constantly attending to each other in that way. Mm -hmm. Can we connect the self-evaluation model, particularly in its comparison process, with that intuition or idea that people have that we much more easily hurt people that are related to us like friends or family than people that we don't even care about, people that are completely unrelated to us and that psychologically for us don't even exist, let's say. Yeah, well, um, I think that intuition that we sometimes uh, are more likely to hurt someone who's close to us uh, plays itself out in all sorts of ways. I mean, certainly the murder statistics bear that out. Uh, yeah. unless, you know, unless, you, uh, unless there's a robbery or something, the people we kill, are, uh, you know, are our spouses, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and fantasy, you know. So, yeah, well, you know, there, there are some obvious answers to that, and that is, you know, opportunity for one thing. But... Uh, from a psychological point of view, again, I come back to the idea that it's people uh, with whom we have some relationship, people like that, they're more likely to, to um, evoke emotional responses. It matters more to us. Mm -hmm. We care more. And um, so uh, we're more likely to do something about it. I mean, a lot of this stuff is sort of emotionally driven. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, yeah, I think um, relationships matter. Every, you know, uh, emo emotions get um, really tuned up when we're talking about uh, 
people who are connected, you know, well, I think I'm important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so let me ask you now, what is the relationship between self-evaluation and self-esteem? Thank you for asking that. <laughs> uh, self-esteem is, you know, one of those concepts that, uh, you know, you, when you go to high school, you say to yourself, oh, his self-esteem is low or her self-esteem is high and that's why they do that or they, they you know. Uh, it's it's like a Bubba psychology. I don't know if you've heard the term Bubba psychology. It, it, a long time ago, a Bubba psychology. Bubba is the Yiddish word for grandmother, and Bubba psychology then is what your grandmother thought. You know, <laughs> everybody knows. You know, self esteem makes a huge difference, and it does. And I agree, it's it's central. But usually, when you talk about self esteem. You're talking about a relatively stable individual difference variable that can be measured. And usually there are questionnaires, you know, how do you feel about yourself, uh, all of that sort of thing. And people are classified and uh, we think of it as a relatively stable attribute. Um, you know, are you more likely to be aggressive if you have high self-esteem or low self-esteem? Well, uh, are you more likely to be happy in marriage if you have high self-esteem or low self-esteem? All of that, you know. So we're talking about sets of people, right? Okay. The SEM model has nothing to do with that. It's not an individual difference variable. In fact, it's not even a real variable. It's what I, I think of as a hypothetical construct. What is a hypothetical construct? It's something you make up. Like Freud made up id, ego, superego. Do they exist? Who knows? Who cares? What's important is they help you to understand something. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So self-evaluation is one of these made up kinds of things. You can observe what happens with uh, when one person is outperformed by another person. You can observe whether they, uh, uh, it, it ends up in the relationship being severed, whether it ends up in uh, uh, the promotion of that person, all of those. You can observe, you can observe closeness, you can observe self-definition or relevance, you can observe performance, but you can't not observe self-evaluation. It's sub if it exists, if it exists, it is sub rosa, but when I tell you about self-evaluation in this context, you say, yeah, that makes sense. Why? Because we have some idea of how the world works. And if that kind of a construct exists, then these relationships are comprehensible. Mm -hmm. So uh, having said that, and you'll notice I move my arms a lot when I say that because you can't really point to it. There are some indices that I think do reflect what I think of as self-evaluation. And those are affective and emotional responses that are detectable, that seem to be going on. And I think, um, in some ways, um, almost all those areas where we think about somehow there are self uh, uh, self protection mechanisms going on they're accompanied by these emotional responses and it may even be the case that it is those emotions that uh, mediate subsequent behaviors um, when we when we're faced with uh, the joy of reflection or when we're faced with the threat of comparison mm -hmm. I understand uh, and uh, I mean, is there any relationship or is self-evaluation in any way connected with something like personal growth? Uh, you know, uh, 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 that's an interesting question because you have to sort of think about, well, what is personal growth? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can think about it in a couple terms. Uh, growth, I mean, the most obvious thing is well, you, when you grow, you get bigger, and bigger often translates to better. And if, if you're getting better and bigger, uh, you know, certainly 
better seems to map onto the performance uh, 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 variable. So uh, in the playing out of these processes can lead to personal growth. I mean, uh, a threat by comparison can be uh, can be addressed in a couple ways. One is, you know, sort of holding the other person back or derogating, but it can also uh, result in the person trying harder, working harder at what they do, or changing how they think of themselves so they move into an area which allows them to get a little bit more positive feedback, a little bit more uh, uh, sort of recognition for being special at something good. So there's growth in that sense. Now, when you think about personal growth, it could be this bigger, better kind of idea, or it could also be better integrated in some kind of a social nexus. You know, having, being able to provide social support, being able to uh, enjoy, utilize uh, social support, and that sort of maps on to the uh, closeness uh, sort of parameter of the model. So, uh, yeah, I think these, these things, uh, these kinds of processes can bring people more closely together. And we saw in committed relationships where you negotiate a kind of a, an ecology of self-identities, people become very mutually supportive. And in some sense, I would suggest that that's part of personal growth. I don't know. Does that make sense to you? Mm, yes, I, I think yeah, I think it makes so. Uh, okay, so related to that, or maybe not, but let's see. But uh, does the self-evaluation model allow for us to better understand uh, the kinds of situations where people I I that are in a particular relationship start growing apart from one another, or? Uh, I mean, what are the contexts or situations or cases where people decide to, man to maintain or to end a particular relationship? Yeah, certainly the, the question you're asking now is sort of a, uh, one of the main questions we asked as we were doing research on this uh, um, model. And, and of course, the model says if you're confronted with somebody who does well in a domain that's not important, there's more joy to be had by getting closer, by connecting yourself more, because the reflection aspect is greater and the joy is greater. So uh, being able to bask in somebody's reflected glory should move you more closely in a relationship. Uh, on the other hand, if you're confronted by somebody who's outdoing you in something that's very important to you, uh, then uh, one, one um, result of that would be to try to increase distance, to reduce the possibility for comparison, to move away. And uh, it, you know, we could talk about. Uh, committed relationships and long-term relationships, but even uh, one of my favorite studies was even in the laboratory, if you give people feedback about somebody else's performance in areas that are important to the self, highly relevant or unimportant to the self, uh, which we did, and then we asked them to go into another room uh, where the other person was already, and they literally sit different distances apart. They literally manipulate the the, uh, uh, the closeness to the other person. So, uh, yeah, I think the model has something to say about um, the ending of relationships, the, the cooling of relationships, in a way that we talked about a little earlier, saying, well, we both know instances in which people got into a romantic relationship and then found themselves, instead of being with Mr. Right, being with Mr. Always Right, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so let, let me ask you, also related to that, um, 
so the model also tells us something about the situations where people might try to interfere with the performance of a, of another person they are related to right yes indeed uh, and that goes again in both directions it might be to support uh, to uh, uh, glorify their achievements or it might be uh, to um, interfere with. And again, you know, uh, some of the earliest studies we did were directly on that question. And uh, uh, we, for example, we, we bring people into a laboratory and they're, uh, they're in there with a friend or a stranger. Uh, and we describe what they're doing as something that is either uh, important to the self or unimportant to the self and um, then they have an opportunity mm -hmm. to either help or hinder the friend that's there or the stranger that's there and uh, we monitor that we monitor it very closely like I said it was it was the first study we've ever done and I couldn't believe the data I mean it it turns out that if there is a possibility that your friend will outperform you on something that's important to you, you end up giving your friend harder clues than you give to the stranger in exactly the same circumstances. Of course, if it's unimportant to yourself, the friend, the friend has an advantage yeah. compared to the stranger. So, yes, um, there are data, you know, correlational data, experimental data, and... Um, it, it, it comes back to this sort of notion that we've been playing with all along, and that is that it sort of seems weird that we would be less helpful to a friend than to a stranger, but yet it happens. Mm -hmm. so, oh, yeah. yeah, I understand. Uh, so let me just ask you about one last topic. Uh, because, I, I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but on my channel, I've been interviewing quite a lot of evolutionary psychologists. And uh, I noticed that back in the early 2000s, you published a paper, a paper titled Self-Evaluation Maintenance and Evolution, Some Speculative Notes. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to quote you briefly now. Uh, you talk there about um, a social performance ecology that may have emerged late in human evolutionary history and could plausibly have led to a sharpening of the comparison and reflection processes that are at the heart of the SAM model. So could you explain what the social performance ecology would have been? I, I could try. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, one, one comment is, you know, in the early 2000s, who wasn't publishing papers on evolution? But, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing, uh, I'll, I'll say when I say I try, and I will, you know, I'll take a crack at it, but it is speculative. And um, a part, of, part of that is the attraction of it. It's it's almost like it's almost like theorizing about psychoanalytic kinds of things because you it's very hard to actually know about what's going on but you there are stories you can make up and the stories are plausible and uh, or seemingly plausible at least to me uh, and I, i'll try to do that um, okay so <laughs> uh if you think about uh, what is self-evaluation, self-esteem, all of those are sort of related kind of ideas. Uh, one, one notion about the derivation of um, self-esteem, which is the individual difference variable, is, and this was by Mark Leary, is that it's a sociometer. It, what, it, what it really reflects is the extent to which we're attractive to groups or would be expelled by groups. And um, those things that uh, uh, raise self-esteem or increase self-evaluation are those things that are valuable. 
to other people as well and would make you attractive. And from an evolutionary perspective, being part of a group, uh, at least at some point, became very important. You couldn't survive, you know, uh, reproduction. Um, so uh, what I would say is it, it's not all, you, you don't need to be attracted to all groups. What matters is your group, and that's the closeness parameter. So uh, this idea that things get multiplied by closeness means because it's coming from the group that matters. Uh, so that, that, that's the closeness parameter. And then, you know, if you sort of think about uh, um, the, evolution, the human evolutionary context, you sort of think about the times when there were surpluses and people started coming together and living in groups and distributing surpluses. Um, and so it, when you get into a group like that, specialization, um, 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 particular roles and so on, uh, I think uh, become important for getting your share of the resources. And so you protect that kind of thing um, from competitors. And what you want to do is boost boost yourself with respect to really good people, which is the uh, 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 reflection process. So in a sense, uh, the kind of thing I'm talking about takes place in almost every group now. But if we think about what happens on an evolutionary, in an evolutionary context, where there is time for selection pressure and so on, it's not hard to make well, it's not hard for me, maybe hard for you. It's not hard for me to make the argument that, in fact, these kinds of processes become ingrained because they're so important in the maintenance of uh, survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I guess that nowadays in psychology, it's always relevant that people try to. Uh, frame things in an evolutionary way because since the advent of evolutionary psychology people have been putting a, lo a lot of emphasis on trying to understand how the kinds of psychological mechanisms that we as humans have have evolved and not only understanding how they operate at the proximal level let's say right right yeah i i, I... I would agree with that. Uh, it, it's also part and parcel of psychology moving more toward um, physical and genetic uh, predeterminants of behavior. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Tesser, I don't know if there's anything more about the self-evaluation maintenance model that we haven't touched on here today. I mean, is there anything else that you would like to refer to or, or not? No, you have a pretty good touch. You, you touched on almost everything. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, let's end the interview here then. Uh, before we go, I don't know if there are any places on the internet where people can get in touch with your work? If there are, could you tell us about that? Gosh, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. If I think of something, I'll send you a URL. But no, I have, a, I have a furniture making website if that interests you. But uh, not, not a psychology at this point in my life. Okay, no problem. I, I will be leaving anyway some links to your work in the description box of the interview so that people can go and check it out. And uh, Dr. Tesser, again, it was a real pleasure to talk to you and to have you on the show. So thank you a lot for accepting the invitation. Well, I, I, I'm thrilled that you asked and I appreciate your interest and thank you, Ricardo. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, 
and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jakob Klinkby, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingart, my three producers, Isar Weber, Rosie, and Jim Frank, and my executive producer, Mikal Ruzieski. Thank you for all.